So thank you for inviting me uh, to speak about a subject that should be something uh, to consider today about ethical internet scanning. Who am I? I'm a cyber security engineer for more than 20 years now. And I have different position in my career. First part in offensive security with penetration testing, web application audits, stuff like that. And the second part in defensive security, uh, I worked for a, a third, the third La Poste, the French post office for a few years on SIM technologies like Splunk, all that stuff. I was a trainer on big data technologies on Splunk, Elastic Stack, and I'm a speaker on some conferences sometimes. And in 2017, I created my company, Onif. I'm the founder and CTO. How many of you have heard about Onif before? Oh, not that much, 30%, I would say. So it's basically a cyber defense search engine and we do collect technical data about internet connected objects and URLs. That's really something important because you are used to scanning IP addresses, but you have to scan URLs too with static IP address hosting many websites. If you just scan the IP address, you won't see the websites and the technology behind that. So it's important to also scan URLs. We do scan the dark web. We collect many information, but for this keynote, another important point is listening to internet background noise. You will see why it's important. We not only collect raw data, but we analyze the raw data. Our goal is to be able to say, this IP address is a camera. This IP address is a VPN server. It's a database and some classification like that. For instance, if you want to know how many VPN servers are connected to the internet today, we just have to use a filter, device.class VPN server, and we have more than 1 million results uh, available. Of course, we do classify the brand from the VPN servers and all other classified devices. So we identify most known brands, Cisco, Citrix, Pulse Secure, all that stuff. You will see why it's of importance to do that. So now for the agenda. Uh, we will first speak about state of the art on ethical internet scanning, what has been published in the past on that subject. You will see also, we'll speak about further ethical considerations. I will speak briefly about some Onipod stuff because it may have some impacts of internet scanning activities. I will show some sample measurements on a specific case and I will conclude. State of the art on ethical internet scanning. It's a quick overview, of course, because it's a 30 minutes keynote. I can't go into much details. And I want to speak about the evolution of the perception against internet wide scans. For the record, Shodan was created in 2009. Everyone knows Shodan. The date is important to me because to me, there was a shift in 2010 which may be the cornerstone, before 2010, by default, it was seen as a criminal behavior to scan the internet. So by default, someone who scanned think he was under attack, basically. And after 2010, a new usage started to be recognized to be used as a defensive technology. To me, Shodan opened that path. So today, it's mostly accepted from internet connected device owners to be scanned, it's part of background noise of being connected to the internet. And few to no papers were discussing the ethical consideration of doing it. It has been discussed, but it's usually integrated as a small paragraph within a more large paper. And to me, it should be a dedicated subject to be discussed. So in this keynote, I won't answer some questions like, is it legal because it's too complex in an international context to answer that question and it's uh, work for legals. And I won't discuss either if it is useful or not. I'm pretty sure many of you already have their own view and I won't change your mind. 
some cases. In 2012, a project called Census 2012, it was actually a complete research paper, basically compromised more than 400k devices named clients in the paper. It was a so-called Karna botnet. And to me, it's neither ethical nor legal. I know I said I won't speak about the legal implication, but I'm pretty sure you agree with me that getting root on a remote device that you don't own is not exactly legal in most countries. They deployed the Karna botnet and basically performed the stuff to scan internet in a distributed manner. That's pretty interesting from a technical standpoint. They performed ICMP big sweeps, launched some Nmap on top 100 ports, performed reverse DNS on IP addresses, and traced routes, which is something great too. In 2013, this is the first ethical discussions I, I have seen somewhere. It was on uh, the ZMAP paper. So ZMAP, you know it. It's a fast internet-wide scanner. And they spoke about some guidelines on how to be, uh, they, they put the guidelines for being a good internet citizenship. And there is seven points, recommended practices. They are all great, but I wanted to go even further. This is a really good basis, but I wanted to, to go further. So today, at ONIF, we have our 10 commandments, our 10 rules on how to do it the ethical way. So number one is you, you should put the web server on your scanner IP addresses. Listening is the wrong part, 80 or 443. And you have to explain the purpose of your scanner, what you are doing, why you are doing that. Well, explain the purpose, the intent. Number two, you have to put an opt-out uh, email address. Why an email address? Remember who will see your scans. They are IT admins. They work with emails. They don't want to fill in a web form to ask, stop scanning me. They don't want to do that. You have to make it easy for them to just reach out to you and say, stop scanning me. In the same kind of way, you have to set your who is records with the name of your organization and the abuse email address. IT admins may use who is tool to, to, to reach out to you. On your web servers, you have to put the complete list of your probe's IP address. Why that? Because maybe the, the IT admin don't want to reach out to you. He don't want to speak with you because he is basically upset. If you give him the list, he will simply put the list in its firewall rules and he will never heard about you again. That's the way of doing it, the ethical way. Another one, the reverse DNS. You have to set the reverse DNS on your IP addresses to point to your project or company. I spoke about abuse email addresses. Of course, you have to answer abuse requests. And you, you have to handle on a timely manner and ask no question. It's their choice, their right. If they want to be not scanned again, ask no question, just execute. Send only standard packets and protocol requests. Don't try to fuzz networks <laughs> or worse. It's not your IP address. You can't do that. Scan slowly. Don't send and don't send packets at one million per second. It's great to scan internet in five minutes, but it's too fast. You will stress targets. Use fixed IP addresses, not trashable ones. I know some companies which are using trashable IP addresses. I'm not in favor of this approach for many reasons, and it will be in contradiction with some of the previous commandments, of course. Then, sometimes we will receive remove collected data requests. It's like GDPR, basically. So you have to answer to that, 
accept that, and again, ask no question. Another point is who watch the watches. When you are a research project or a company, and you are scanning internet, you have some kind of power. Who watched the watches? We deployed some um, basically sniffers to listen to internet background noise. And the goal was to classify actors. Do they abide by the 10 rules, for instance, or at least some rules? We wanted to know that. So the question is, how ethical are main internet-wide scanners? Spoiler, I won't give name. I won't reply to the question. I give a, a number of actors here. Lika X will speak tomorrow uh, morning, the first uh, keynote of the day. Um, but basically, all these scanners and more have some tags, and we try to, to check who is ethical and who is not. So no name dropping here. I'm not here to give good points or bad points. That's not the purpose. And maybe some competitors will say the same for Unif. They are not ethical because Y, X. But well, the goal here is to show some cases. And competitors may have a different view. So questionable actor sample one, Xors, you may know this guy. Maybe he's here today. Uh, was asking to some vendor on Twitter uh, if someone knows their scanner's IP addresses. One of the guys working for this company replied that it was childish, uh, childish and ridiculous behavior to ask such a question. It's like an ostrich burying its head in the sand. So they are not giving away their IP addresses. They are doing whatever they can to hide their IP addresses. So you don't have the choice to opt out. You can't block their scanners. It should be your choice as a network owner, not the choice of a vendor. Another questionable actor, it was back in uh, 2021, December, on uh, lock for shell scans. You do remember how the world was in crisis searching for, do we use this library? Which asset do we have which is exposed? It was quite a mess. And an actor scanned the full internet, 3.8 billion IP addresses to search for some vulnerable machines. They do it mostly the good way because they basically use most of the 10 rules, uh, I put it. But I have some other arguments. The main problem is about blind scanning. You send billions of protocol requests on the whole internet. Of course, most IP addresses won't be vulnerable. You know that before starting. Not everyone is using Java on every open port on the internet. You know most won't be vulnerable. Problem two, it creates stress on target networks during an already emergency situation. It's really stressful for network owners. And the last problem, they communicated on the results, which is great. They, they shared the results, which is even greater, but it was only 15,000 vulnerable machines. You send 3.8 billion requests to find 15,000 vulnerable machines. The signal to noise ratio is far too high. We have to be smarter, more ethical than cyber criminals. So now I will go even further on ethical considerations. And I will just start with a use, simple use case. Ransomware internet exposure in 2022. So cyber criminals are scanning the internet since a couple of decades. 
they are searching for initial access vectors, AAVs. It was not called that name before, but well, that's a new term. Those IAVs are sold by initial access brokers, AABs. So it's a business. And ransomware has become pandemic since a few years. You know that. To steal, wipe data, demand ransom, well, to make some big money. What are the main AAVs? The main AAVs, we have some intel from our customers and from the intel community, of course. The main AAVs today are RDP and VPN credentials and critical vulnerabilities. It's not that complicated if you look at it that way. So there is a phishing, of course, there is a phishing, but it's out of scope for, for this keynote. But for your internet exposure, it's RDP, VPN credentials, critical vulnerabilities. So let's focus on that. The CISA, an American organism, US organism, um, published the known exploited catalog. It's a list of known to be exploited vulnerabilities. The one exploited by cyber criminals. We had such kind of list before the CISA back in January 2020. I think the, the, the catalog, uh, I didn't find the, the date of release, but I think it was in 2021 or, uh, uh, first half of 2022. I didn't find the, the origin. Well, we scanned at that time two critical vulnerabilities. One of them is on Fortinet devices. There are still some devices vulnerable today on the internet. The other one is Citrix on uh, Citrix gateways. And there are still some vulnerable devices on the internet today. How come they don't have been found yet? Well, um, today we scan more than 20 critical vulnerabilities at internet scale. Our list is public. So the next question is how to check vulnerabilities the ethical way. We have to add more rules and to discuss more between scanners, actors. But to me, at least, there is five rules to, to take into account here. No blind vulnerability scanning. Don't scan 3.8 billion IP addresses to find 15,000 devices vulnerable. And we, we at ONIF can do this targeted scanning because we identify devices. We are able to say there is one million Fortinet, uh, Fortigate device exposed on the internet. We check only those ones. It's targeted scanning, no blind scanning. So signal, signal to noise ratio is lower. Take no risk to crash the target. Don't try to check a vulnerability requiring to exploit a stack overflow, heap overflow. Don't mess with remote device memory, basically. Leave no trace at all. And when I say leave no trace, it's not you exploit the issue, there are some files created on the file system, and you remove the file afterwards. No. If checking the vulnerability requires to create a file, you can't test it remotely. It leaves trace. It's basically an intrusion, which makes me going to the next point, check in a non-intrusive way. We are dealing with critical vulnerabilities, and some of them can be tested in a non-intrusive way. This is the interesting vulnerability. This is the one which can go through our checklist. And of course, we want to test only critical vulnerabilities because we are not a vulnerability scanner, basically. If you want to test all the vulnerabilities on your perimeter, there are some better technologies to do that. I put a link um, on a blog post we did in December 2021, explaining why we won't scan the whole internet for a partial issue. So if you want to, to have more information on how we came to this list, uh, you can read this blog post. And uh, I don't know if there are some shadow server guys here, but uh, they they came also to the same conclusion. They didn't want to, to scan the whole internet for 
Look for shell. Uh, just for the story, we don't scan the whole internet for look for shell, but we scan in a targeted manner. For instance, there are some VMware products vulnerable, uh, some uh, uh, Xen Mobile also, which is vulnerable. Those, we are scanning them, targeted scanning. So what about Honeypots? Do they have an impact on the scan results? There is a new trend since a few years. Honeypots, of course, are an old technology, but their use is changing. Today, every time a new critical vulnerability is discovered, there are hundreds or thousands of Honeypots which gets deployed instantly. It changes the shape of the internet. As a scanner, you see that. And the question is how to measure, how to measure general exposure when you know there are some thousands of Honeypots. And LikaX observes the same. We are not the only actor observing that. And the states, sometimes it's double. Say you have 1 million forty gate exposed. Well, it will double, it not be 2 million for this one. But the number is really increasing. And sometimes we are into some situation where there are more onipots than actual vulnerable machines, which is quite interesting. And I, I have an example. There was a vulnerability in uh, F5 uh, big IP devices. And uh, of course, it was a critical vulnerability. We wanted to test it. So we tested it. There was only a few hundred vulnerable devices. And by looking at the response, in fact, we have seen they always replied with the same payload. Whatever the vulnerability did check, which should have changed the reply, the target was always replying with the same payload. So it was obviously Unipots. And when you put them besides the Unipots and the true machines, there was nearly no vulnerable machines exposed on the internet. Some vulnerabilities generate far too much hype. Oh my God is another example, really good example. And regarding this Unipot stuff, I would say any sufficiently advanced Onipot is indistinguishable from a real machine. You have to, to keep that in mind when you scan the internet and you do some measurement. You will have some Onipot results. It's part of the, I would say, background noise of internet scanning. So now, with that in head, um, I will speak about the latest Fortinet vulnerability, which appears, uh, appeared uh, somewhere like one week ago, I think, or two. CV 2022, blah, blah, blah. I'm not good at numbers. So it's the latest critical vulnerability in uh, some Fortinet products, like FortiGate, FortiSwitch, FortiProxy. It's a remote authentication bypass. And uh, if you exploit the vulnerability, you just get admin on the device, which is pretty bad on a firewall or a switch. Um, the management API can be used to remotely set an SSH key, basically. There is a public intrusive exploit made by the, the people who discovered the vulnerability. If we search for Specifically, 40 get devices exposed. We have somewhere like 1.1 million exposed devices today. We designed a check, a non-intrusive check, because remember that's our goal, how to ethically scan for vulnerabilities. And it was quite easy to design the check, basically. It's the same as the intrusive exploit. We just remove the payload. You see in comments, yes, it's per. <laughs> I've seen Alex. It's better, yeah. Uh, the public exploit sets the public key. Here you see fake key. And we just re removed the payload. So it's the same request. 
but it's not valid as an API call. And it is taken with care by the device. It knows the code, knows how to handle it in a gentle way. It just reply with 424 failed dependency. So, so the device in the, in the code take care of this case. So we know the device is vulnerable and we have tested it in a non-intrusive way we, with no impact, no risk to crash the target and all the commandments that were put previously. Now for the results, which includes, of course, some onipots to some extent. Not that much vulnerable devices. Remember, it was 1.1 million devices which were tested. And it's uh, one per 1,000. Yes, simply one per 1,000 vulnerable IP addresses. It's not that much. To conclude, I question, do we need internet-wide scans? And uh, I found a tweet uh, from Alex, which I, I loved because this is for uh, the people uh, like Alex, me, or all the old, which are doing security for more than 20 years. At one point, we had ACL, Firewall, DMZ, Bastion. We segregated networks. Well, we did the, the things the right way, finally. But today, you have flat networks. And the single door to enter the flat networks is RDP, VPN, or a critical vulnerability. That's how it is today. Some explanation, yes, economics, of course. It costs. Cost reduction is something. And security people will, will always be seen as a cost. You have to accept it. That's why, to me, we must perform internet-wide scans. And this includes scans for AAVs, including vulnerabilities. We have to check those AAVs. There is a CISA catalog. We have to do it the ethical way. That's why I think it's important as researchers or comp companies to discuss about how to do it the ethical way. Because remember, bad guys do it all the time. They do it since more than two decades. They have dedicated organizations. They have dedicated teams. They are basically better than us at doing that. They do it for more than us. And bad guys know your assets better than you because there is incentive. If they find the entry point, they win millions. In the security industry, if you protect your network, you just have your salary. It's not the same ratio. And you can't secure assets you don't know, of course. So you have to scan your networks. The ethical way. We should create a standard set of rules for ethical internet scanning activities. Maybe an RFC. Yeah, open to discussion, but we have to do something. You know this quote from uh, Phil Zimmerman, if privacy is outlawed, only outlaws will have privacy. I would say if AAV scanning is not done, only criminals will benefit from it. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Thank really you. like the, the fact that you talk about the uh, um, ethical hacking and especially the maybe the, the way of going forward to create a kind of internet standard or internet draft for that. That's uh, great. Uh, I need to be more careful on my tweet that I don't end up on, on conclusion web uh, uh, slide, but okay, that's fine. Um, is there any questions? Yeah. Um, thank you very much. In your activities, do you have um, a lot of people emailing you to opt out? Or it's, it's not that much because we apply the commandments we defined here, for instance, scan slowly. So if you scan slowly, 
you are basically under the radar, I would say, even though it's not the goal. The goal is, is not to stress the target networks. So if people are not stressed, basically they don't send opt out, opt out requests. So it's not that much. Great. Thank you. Is there any, any other questions or comments? Yeah. I will do my sport today. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Uh, I, I saw that you had a Perl script and I remember in uh, ACLU 2016, you talked about Metabrick and I was wondering whether you still use that or if you have different tools uh, to do your scanning. <laughs> Maybe a few we will love here. Uh, the, the complete scan uh, scanning technology has been developed in-house and 100% in Perl. And Metabrick is at the basis of the technology. Uh, more people on the other side, of course. <laughs> Noise. Thank you for the keynote. Um, it's not a question, but uh, a remark regarding the, your slide where there is more only pots on available on the internet than vulnerable devices. Uh, just Quick information, so I'm working for the Internet Storm Center. We have a worldwide uh, honeypot uh, network, so dshield.org. And that's what we try to do. Because when there is a new vulnerability, we try to, as soon as possible to reconfigure the honeypots to mimic the renewable device and to be able to gather interesting uh, information. For example, the latest Fortinet uh, exploit, we got some of them. So we saw, we learn IP addresses from the attackers. We learn who is scanning the Internet and so on. So, I fully agree that the, it gives a false sense of insecurity because number increase, you have a lot of hits in your system or a lot of vulnerable device. They are fake, but on all sides, it's really helpful to gather also a lot of information. Yeah. This comment. Yeah. I completely agree. And that's why I, I didn't state it was a bad thing to do. It's not a bad thing. We, we, we have to do it. It's, it's just when we do internet measurements, we have to, to take that into account. We have to think that some of the results will be on ipods. That's the game. That's okay. Because it is necessary to have some on ipods. Yeah, yeah. But another interesting thing with doing a check in a different way. I'm pretty sure if I send my check on your on ipod, you won't reply this code. So I won't see you as vulnerable. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Great. Thank you very much. Thank you.